1 Corinthians. Praise God. Amen. In Corinthians, I want us to look at just some thoughts on Corinthians today. 1 Corinthians 1. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God. And Sothenes, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ, called to be saints with all that in every place call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, both theirs and ours. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you and peace be unto you. Amen from Jesus Christ today. In verse 4 and 5. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ. And here's his wish for all of you today. That in everything you are enriched by him. In all utterance and in all knowledge. In every utterance and in every knowledge that you'd be enriched by God. Uh, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, that, and you're born again of the Spirit of God, and you've been saints, washed in the blood. So, so verse 7, that you come behind in no gift. Everybody say, gift. Yes. God wants you to have every gift flowing from heaven. He wants it to come straight to you. He wants you to come in earnestly, the best gifts. He doesn't want you to come behind in any way, shape, or form of the gifts that God gave, and we've been studying those gifts on a couple Wednesday nights ago in the house of God here that God wants you to come behind waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Anybody waiting this morning? Amen. Counting the days, wait, waiting to see Jesus, wanting to see him with all your heart and soul, waiting to see the rapture of just Jesus Christ. You could call it just the rapture of seeing Jesus. Amen. Just seeing him and being so filled with God and, and having this earthly body finally dissolve and putting on him or immortality forever. Praise God. Being immortal forever. I'm looking forward to that. Who shall also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you are called unto the fellowship of his son Jesus Christ our Lord. The next two verses says this. It says now I beseech you and I just guess I, I just want to say this. This was the church of Corinth. There was the issues in the church of Corinth. And this is a Holy Ghost filled church. If I was if Lyle was here, I'd say, Lyle, Lyle, this is a Holy Ghost filled church. Paul was the pastor. There were uh, this was the discipleship program was Paul's, the Apostle Paul's a pretty good teacher, pretty good preacher. And yet there was there was issues in the church divisions. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind. Dear God, in the same mind, in the same judgment, almost like the book of Acts, one mind, one accord, one faith, one belief, where you come together. And what was happening was they were following, some were following Apollos, and some were of Cephas, and some were of Paul, and Paul's saying, is Christ divided? Heck no, he's not. Christ sent me not to baptize in verse 17, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross, there was a preaching, it was deliberately, and it was on Christ crucified, Christ resurrected, Christ enthroned with power and glory in heaven above, and Christ sending the power back down and, and them now moving in this church that was filled with gifts and power and anointing. He says in chapter 2 that the preaching would not be with the enticing words of man's wisdom, but in power. And in demonstration that now we're in the church age. This isn't just the Acts of the Apostles. This is the church of Corinth. And he wants the power still to be. That your faith would be in the power of God and the strength of God and the glory of God. Somebody say Amen. In verse chapter 3, we're working up to the Lord's table, by the way. He says, And brethren, I could not speak to you as unto spiritual. Why not? But as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ, I fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are able. For ye are carnal. For whereas there is among you envy and strife divisions, are you not carnal? 
Don't you walk as men? And what I want to remind you guys is this is the Apostle Paul. This is his church. This is his discipleship program. There's issues in that church in Corinth. Can, can I get an amen? Can you see that? There was issues in this church under Paul in that day. <clears throat> he says you're trying to build on, on, on laborers. You, you're trying to make men. You're trying to follow men. You need to follow Jesus Christ. Christ isn't divided. By the time this church is, these letters continue, by the time you get to chapter 5, it's, reportedly common, it's reported commonly that there's fornication among you. The word fornication is pornea. Now the church has other issues, and it's infidelity, or incestuous relationships, or pornea that has come in, is, is the Greek root word there, and that's among you. And he says, I've judged you already not being there, but I, I simply want to say that, that Paul was condemning this, but he was having to constantly deal with Corinth at this time. And they were a, a church that was so close to the beginning. <coughs> So close under the greatest pastor, uh, arguably, of the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, the one that was given the epistles, the Pauline epistles. He wrote these to correct the church that, that, was, that was having issues now. In chapter 6, if you guys just read your header in chapter 6, it says, avoiding lawsuits with Christians. Here now, these, these things that were in these spirit-filled Christians, these these uh, full gospel believers, these tongue talkers, these uh, uh, people that were, were full of God, they came behind in no gift. There's, there's issue. In verse 7, 6, 7, Now therefore there is utterly a fault among you because you go to the law with one another. Why, why do you not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Don't, don't you know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, or abusers with themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. He's reminding them where they've come from. He's telling them that their body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and not to yoke it with any other thing. And what he's doing, he, he, we're, we're moving towards 1 Corinthians 11, where we're about to take the Lord's table, the Lord's cup. And he's, we're looking at the church of Corinth. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, this was Paul's church. This was the church of Corinth. If you go forward, <clears throat> there's admonitions in marriage. There's admonitions to... to uh, to the wives, there's admonitions to the husbands, there's admonitions to them that are single, there's admonitions to them uh, about how to live a Christian life and how to keep your, your purity and how to fast and how to, how to uh, stay on fire for God and not to, be, not to let your interests be divided from the thing that we're called to do. In chapter 8, there's a debate over the food sacrificed to idols. Can we eat it or not? And Paul is teaching them to not, uh, in verse 12 and 8, 12, but when you sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Wherefore, if, you, if meat make my, thy brother to offend, I'll eat no flesh. And while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. He's saying, live your life so that others would see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Don't take your liberties, which God has given you, freedoms in this world, freedoms that we have in the United States of America, and use them and cause your brother to stumble in the faith. It's talking about, I believe it's talking about idols. I believe it's talking about whatever those idols are today in the secular culture in which we live in. I believe it's alcohol. You can put alcohol in there. You can talk about drinking wine. You can talk about any other thing. Brother, if it's going to encourage somebody with a weak conscience... It says you sin against Christ. Brothers and sisters, in 9, he gives up his rights. In 10, he warns against idolatry. Look at chapter 10. Again, we're working towards 11. And we're going to take a, just a few seconds here. 10, 6. 
Now, these things were written for our examples. This is a warning against idolatry. He's talking to the Corinthian church, but he's going way back. He's talking about Moses. I don't want you to be ignorant. In verse 1, how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They did all eat the same spiritual meat and drink the same spiritual drink. They were following Christ. The sea was red. It was a type and shadow of Jesus Christ. But in five, but with many of them, God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. A title in a different, in my MEV says overthrown in the wilderness. It says something about being overthrown in the wilderness. Brothers and sisters, this is the journey towards heaven. And these are the admonitions upon what the end of the world is going to be. And six, look at six with me. Now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Let's look at these things together. Neither be idolaters. As were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Verse 7. What does that mean? What is idolatry first? And let's have a let's have a, a conversation. What is idolatry? What's the definition of idolatry? Worshiping idols. What were idols, both in the Old Testament and in the present day culture of Corinth? What what were idols? What were the idols that they were worried about? Worship of self. Worship of self. So hedonistic things. It's good. Anything else? Money. Money. Covetousness is mentioned and will be mentioned throughout this. That men wouldn't be lovers of money. Jonathan, anything? Mark, anything? Their own creation. Okay. Things they made. Absolutely. That's that's really good. Romans one talks about the rather worshiping worshiping uh God or the creation, the four-footed beast and all these things. And, and an idol, as you study it out, and I studied it out, was an idol is anything. It's anything man-made. Some people think it's a Christmas tree at Christmas time. Some people think it's this. Some people think it's the things that you adorn. But Aaron in the Old Testament, he made a pretty good idol for us to always remember. It was a golden calf, right? They fashioned it with their own hands. They began to worship it. They began to... To, to, to give it powers and, and to ascribe it things, and yet it was, it was a heathen thing. And they had learned from the people around them. And they were giving those things power. <clears throat> well, that golden calf had no power. You guys know it and I know it. it. Didn't have any power at all, but what men attributed to it in sacrifice. But men were worshiping and bowing down to it. Now then, now they're venerating it. And now they've given time, and now they've given money, and now they're sacrificing to it. And they, uh, and instantly it goes from that to a wicked, wild, fornicating thing around a golden calf. And anytime you see the literal in the Old Testament, it's figurative or spiritual many times in the New Testament. So the fornication was a spiritual fornication. What was literal there was a spiritual fornication in the New Testament. Look at it. Look at it over and over again. In the New Testament here, I believe it's talking about uh, people that sat down to eat and to drink. They're actually eating and drinking and rising up to play with, with the culture. They've sat down. They're going, to, they're going to spend time there. They're going to eat of that. They're going to drink of that. They're going to rise up to play with that. Neither, verse 7, verse 8, on the heels of that playfulness, on the heels of that entertainment, on the heels of that going into that, neither let us commit fornication. The very next The very next uh, line, as some of them that committed and fell in one day, three and 20,000. Look at that. There's a lot of neithers here. Verse seven, verse eight, 
So you see idolatry, and then in eight you see uh, fornication, and you see them falling. And what, what, were the, what were they falling to? They were following because they were worshiping at Baal Peor. If you go back to Numbers, they worshiped, and they went into the women of Moab, and they, they became one with a culture that they were supposed to annihilate and, and get rid of. They had become one with the heathens. They had become one with paganism. They had become one with hedonism. And now they're in fornication and there was a plague. And it killed 23,000 people and God shut them off, cut them off, and the earth opened and destroyed them. These are written for the admonition of the church. Neither let them tempt Christ. There's another neither in nine. As some of them also tempted or were tried and were destroyed of serpents. Things that bit. Things that, and that goes back to when Moses had to raise up the serpent on the pole. And the hemorrhoids came out and the diseases that came upon the people. And the only way to get rid of the diseases that, that were coming upon the Israelites, which should have been on the Gentiles, was to lift up and put a serpent on the pole. And to literally typology, look to Jesus Christ and ask Jesus to be our healer and our deliverer. Now all these things happened. Okay, ten. Sorry, there's another neither. Is that the fourth neither? One, two, three, four. Neither. This is written to the church. New covenant. New testament. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Brothers and sisters, there's a, a constant move of murmuring amongst the, the Old Testament people in the wilderness. During their wilderness time. During the wilderness time, they wanted flesh. So God finally got fed up and gave them flesh pots. They were, they were tired of this white bread, this taste that they had, this, uh, this manna that, that, that kept appearing for them. They wanted to store it up, and every time they tried to store it up, it turned into worms. They, they didn't like the provision of God. They weren't happy. They, they were discontent. They, they needed more than God supplied. They wanted more. And, and the admonition was, if you can't kill, if you can't kill uh, faith, you, you're going to kill the messenger. And so they went after Aaron and they went after Moses. And Moses and Aaron had to pray and, and, and really reverse the, the, the tide that was against them. But look at verse 11 with me. Now all these things happened unto them for it and samples. And they are written for our, our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. In other words, what that means is until the end of the world come, all of these things, playing, fornication, tempting, murmuring, these, these four ne neithers are going to be upon you. And in five, it says they were, these people were overthrown in the wilderness. Well, the church doesn't want to be overthrown in the wilderness. Amen? We don't want to be overthrown at all. In 12, he says, let him that thinketh he standeth. That means to have right standing by faith with Jesus Christ. Take heed, lest he fall. 13, look at it with me. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able but will with the temptation make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. You guys are all going to be tempted. It's going to come against you, the world, the flesh, the devil, the temptation, uh, the chance, the opportunity to, to tempt Christ with your own walk and to walk out there as close to sin as you possibly can and to get real close to the world and to tempt Christ, it says. Now, our God is faithful. And yet there's, there's the opportunity to do this. You have the opportunity to murmur against God and His provision. You have the opportunity to eat and drink of the idols of this culture and this community. As they did in verse 7. And to be a part of a system that is anti-God. And yet God has made a way of escape for all of us. I believe that this is exactly what it is. It's the straight gate. 
It's the narrow way. There's a broad way where everybody else is going, and the Bible says few to be to find it. The straight gate, the narrow way, is the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. The straight gate is, is, is following Jesus Christ. It's, it's being in obedience to his commands. It's wanting him in the depth of our soul. It's wanting to seek him. It's wanting the presence of God. It's wanting to move from prayer to praise to into the worship of God. It's wanting everything I can from God. It's coming behind in no gift, no utterance, waiting for the Lord Jesus Christ. It's being stirred by God, and it's stirring other people for God. And it's, 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 it's being filled with all the fullness of God brothers and sisters, and we need, we need that in this time and in this hour. It's, it's coming together. It's being the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, not separated, not isolated, not isolated, not picked off. It's a, it's a togetherness of what God is doing. And here Jesus is just bringing these admonitions to every single one of us. Let's look deeper into the idolatry. Go to verse 18. For behold, Israel after the flesh... Now I want you, let's insert that, let's say the church, let's say the New Testament evangelical church after the flesh. Because Israel is the Old Testament sample. So let's say this is the church of the New Testament now for just a second. Behold, the church of today after the flesh, are they not, are not they which eat of the sacrifices, partakers of the altar? If you're eating of the sacrifices, of the things of this world. If you're eating there, you're spending t- time there, you're rising up to play there, you're, you're, you're doing those things. Look at this. <clears throat> 19. Look at this. What shall I then? What, what say I then? In other words, what is this then? What am I trying to say? That the idol is anything that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything. What does that mean? Put it up on the board and you guys talk about it. What is an idol? An idol is anything, okay, so it could be anything, or that which is offered. What does that mean? I want to know what you guys think it means. Louder. Time, offering money, offering time, offering adoration, love. Very, very good. Anybody want to add to that? So, absolutely. Your time, your efforts, your energies, your expenditures, your your. It's, it's taking devotion, right? We learned about that this morning. It's, it's what we're devoted to. It's, it's what we're giving ourselves to. Church, I guess what I should say as, as a pastor is what are, what are you devoted to? Now look at this. <clears throat> In 14, read it. Read it there a second. 14, my dearly beloved, I love you, church. I love you, church. I love you. I love you. You're my beloved. You're my beloved, my beloved, my beloved, my bride, my bride, my bride, my bride. Turn to your neighbor and tell him you love him. I love you. (laughs) Did you know Paul loved his church? Paul loved Corinth. Dearly beloved, 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 beloved. James, tell Sam you love her. (laughs) Becca, tell Joe you love him. Just trying to keep you guys straight in the back row. Now look at this. It says, flee from idolatry. I speak as unto wise men. Everybody that's wise, raise your hand in this room. Wait, raise it high. I'm so wise. Amen. I speak unto the wise men of the church of Corinth. Judge what I'm saying. Please judge it. Make a judgment call. And you're going to see where this is going. 16, read it with me. Read it with me in your Bibles. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, we're about to break the bread today. Is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Right? It's Jesus. Our life is Jesus. Our hope is Jesus. Our eternal 
glory is in Jesus. Amen? It's in Jesus what he did at the cross. It's in Jesus him saving our souls. It's in Jesus the redemption. In the power of his name and the power of his blood. He's him pulling us out of the world. It's him pulling us out of Egypt. It's him bringing us to the Red Sea. It's him baptizing us in the blood of Jesus Christ. It's him crushing the Egyptians that were right on our tail and giving us freedom and breaking every chain of bondage so that we could walk in holiness following the cloud by, by day and a pillar by night of fire. And there's nothing and no one that can contend with the mighty God that we serve. Somebody shout hallelujah to the Lamb of God. His name is Jesus Christ. He's King of Kings. He's Lord of Lords. Amen. And neither is there salvation in any other. For there's no other name under heaven given, given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus Christ is everything. And that's what this is talking about. Hallelujah. Oh, you can't yawn in here. I heard that yawn in the back row. No way. Not anymore. 17, for we being one, we being many, church, are one bread. Think about it. They, they bring Jesus' body down. They lay it down. Jesus has just given up the ghost. His body's still there. We're of one bread. We're of one body. We cannot be separated. We cannot be divided. Twenty. That's where we were. But I say that the things that which the Gentiles, everybody say the Gentiles. Gentiles. The things which they sacrifice, they sacrifice to what? Sarah's studying. Uh, read, read head. I did a study on this last night. <clears throat> Behind every Baal Peor, Peor was the place. Baal was the demon. Behind all of the entertainments and the demons of the Old Testament, there was Pan. Peter Pan. Ever heard of Peter Pan? Yeah. Pan. Pan was a, was a, was a nifty-looking demon. Muse. Muse was another good demon in the Old Testament. You ever heard the word amusement? Is the devil behind amusement? Yes. Pan is where we get the word Panic. Behind all of these Old Testament pagan gods, Baal Peor, Baal this, Baal this, Baal that, Molech, all these different, they were, they were the ensample, the type, but behind them, if you take, took off the mask, what's that show where there's the mask, and you, you, what's that old, uh, uh, Phantom of the Opera. Behind the pretty, beautiful news of all these things, you guys, if you pulled the thing back, there was Pan, there was amusement, there was uh, Lilith, Lilith Fair, everybody heard of Lilith Fair, the, the women's music deal, no, okay, crazy. Behind all of these things that are coming back, okay, the mask behind that was the devil. The things that the Gentiles worship to, they, they go down and they pay homage to, they open up their wallet, they pay money to. They venerate with time, effort, worship, running up in church. Behind those things, according to this, There's a devil. They sacrifice to devils and not to God. And not to God. They have no interest in God in, those, in, in, in these places. There's no time for them. They're, they're, God is not mentioned. He's not prayed to. He's not sought after. Uh, this time is not about God. <clears throat> and I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. 21 says, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Again, going back to the, 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 the four neithers there. In context, you cannot be a partaker of the Lord's table and the table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? 
Did you know that the Lord is a jealous God? In the Ten Commandments, isn't there a commandment that talks about, thou shalt have no other gods before me? It's just it's being brought up again. There, there shall be no other veneration. There will be no other worship. There will be no other intermarriage with other cultures or, or pagan deities. Or There will be none of those things. No, we're not stronger than God is. We don't know better than he does. And we do not provoke him to jealousy. 23, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things don't build us up. Church, I want this to be a, a, an edifier. I want every time you come into the house of God that you get built up spiritually. How? Preach the word of God. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. You guys are here in the body for one another. You're not here selfishly for your own gain, right? You're here because you're part of the body of Christ. If Jesus was laying out here and that body was still there, he still had organs in his body. He still, everything was fitly joined together. You're the body of Christ. There's a togetherness. What's my theme for the summer? Together. You can't send the toe to Ethiopia. You can't send the heart to, to Canada. You can't and have the body function or be resurrected in its power. The body has fitly joined together. Amen? 1 Corinthians 12, you read it all. It cannot be broken apart. And some of the body doesn't go over and worship over here, and some of the body doesn't go worship over here, and we don't worship idols. Amen? None of us worship idols. So somebody say amen. We don't give money. We don't venerate. We don't give. No, 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 no. We're Christians. We're bought by the blood of Jesus. And we take the Lord's table. That's our table. Amen. That's our supper because it's our bread and butter. It's what we are. Praise God. 11, chapter 11. We're getting to take communion here in just a second, a few minutes. 11, 1. Be followers of me as I am also of Christ. Now, I want to, I'm doing this purposely that I'm sticking very close to the word-by-word -word translation of the King James Bible. Let's read it. Now, I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances that I delivered to you. But I would have you to know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of every woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. And then he goes into talking about praying or prophesying with your head covered or uncovered. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring it down to, uh, it has nothing to do with your hair length. And every woman said, praise the Lord. It has nothing to do with how long your hair is. Your hair is a, a beautiful covering from the Lord, praise God, and God made it that way. It's not about having to wear a doily on your head when you pray, even though some people interpret it that way. What it is talking about, <clears throat> what it is talking about is power on your head and a covering. And it's talking about the man being the covering for the woman. In verse 3, that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesy, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. Don't let there be, man, don't let anything between you and the Lord. You're the very image of God. Okay? But every woman that prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head. What's that talking about? If there's no covering for the woman, if you're not spiritually covered by the man, and you're in right relationship with the man, and you're and you're you're out of you're speaking out of turn. You're making decisions. You're doing whatever. You're, you're if you're not if you don't have the right covering of the man and God, you're out of order in God's plan and in His playbook. Verse five. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered, say the next word with me. Dishonor. What's the number one need of a man? Come on, marriage counseling people in the back row. What is the number one thing for man? Respect. Honor and respect. We get that from God. 
That's a God thing. God put that in there. Dishonors her head, for that is even all as one as if she were shaven. What does that mean? Do you remember that, that movie, The Passion of the Christ? Remember how they depicted the devil in that movie? She was a prostitute. She was shaven. She was a female. And she was bald-headed. It's kind of freaky looking. Right? Remember that? Anybody saw it? Some people saw it. I believe that they took that from this, this passage. So the, the rebel, the, the demon that, that opens up and comes in through rebellion, comes in, comes in and, and what the Lord is saying, it would be better for her to be taken out, shaven, and treated like a, shr- a prostitute. Six, for if the woman be not covered, have a covering, let her also be shorn, but if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. Well, what a woman is going to get her power and her anointing and her, her walk with God, her truth. She's going to get the virtue as she walks under the covering of God Almighty and a husband that is lovingly nourishing and, ch- and ch- cherishing her and taking care of her. Amen. And loving her like Christ loved the church. If she's walking into that, my God, there's going to be an anointing on that woman. And that woman in the church has opportunity to speak. Somebody say amen. And to talk and to share and and, and to exhort and to prophesy. It says right there, prophesy, right in the context. That woman that's under the headship of God and under the leading of her husband. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Look at verse 10. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. They're watching. Did you, did you, now for that, for that cause. Now jump forward to verse 11. Jump forward to chapter 11, verse 30. And say, for this cause. Now go back to 11, 10, and read the first three words. For this call. Now go back to 1 Corinthians 11, and read 30. 1 Corinthians 11. For this cause. Let me back up and show you guys something about the Lord's Supper. 27, I mean, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty seven. 27, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. How in the world could we be unworthy when we come to take the Lord's Supper? Unrepentance. Unrepentant. What else have we learned? Out of order. Idolatry, worshiping a world system, paying homage to it. What else? Murmuring, complaining, discontentment in the house of God. You're discontent with Jesus Christ and your walk with God. That's another one. What else? What would what else really kind of cancel out is we're judging ourselves whether we should take the communion cup or not. Anything else? Well, fornication, chapter 5, right? Pornia, chapter 5. 70% of the men in the church are struggling with it, okay? Jesus is saying, through, through the Apostle Paul, is saying, judge this. You make the judgment. Judge it in your heart. Is your heart right with God? Is there idolatry? Do you weep and cry over things from this world? Because they have your heart. Music, sports, farming, tractor, pickup, whatever it is. The Holy Spirit's dealing with me on things. <laughs> He's dealing with me on things. This message is coming to Aaron Tremble before it comes to, to, to you guys. But I was just looking at this context of, is there divisions in the house? Is there strife in the house? Are we fighting or warring? That's got to be in here too. 
Look at verse 18, right before they take the Lord's Supper. Look at this. 1 Corinthians eleven eighteen. 17 and 18. Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not that you come together not for the better, but for the worse. What's it like when you get the body of Christ together? Is it good, bad, or ugly? Is it the love of God pouring through everybody and we all want to be around each other because of the Christ and everybody else? And we want to be community and we want to be loving and we want to be, you know, we're just going to spend the day together. It's the Lord's day. 18, let's read it together. For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be, what's it say, Ben? Divisions among you. And I partly believe it. Now look at this. And draw a line from divisions to heresies. In your Bible, draw a line there. For, the, for there must be also heresies among you. That they which are approved may be manifest among you. The second that there's division, there's going to be heresy. Because the truth of the word of God is love, it's forgiveness, it's the, the body of Christ, it's togetherness, it's, it's, it's love covers a multitude of sins, it's love your neighbor as yourself, it's you're going to know everybody by how much they love each other because that's the fruit of the Spirit, amen, living inside of us. And it's patient, it's kind, it's long-suffering, and it never fails. Amen? So as you and I prepare to take communion today, let's look at the context of what started in 1 Corinthians 1 and bring it all the way up through 10 and then into 11 where we get to take the Lord's Supper. And then the admonition to us is this, and it's honest and it's just. As the ushers, would you come with the, with the communion today? And I'm going to read this. I also want to show you guys this. Ben, check this out in 22. They were eating. In 21 and 22, they were eating and drinking. And they, they must have just kind of been uh, gluttonizing or, or, or fighting over who got to eat first or whatever else. And he, he shamed them about this. He says, don't you guys have houses to eat or to drink in or despise ye the church of God? You've got your own houses to eat and drink in. But when you come to the church of God, it ought not to be this way. Well, let's stop here for a second. This entire message is to edify the body of Christ. We're looking at Corinth 2,000 years later. But do these examples, even from Old Testament and from 2,000 years today, do they minister to us in any way? Let's be honest. Do they touch us in any way, or is this just folklore and legend? And Does it minister to us? Have we discerned the Lord's body? And now I want to ask this question to every theologian. Look at this. And then I'll, 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 we'll take the communion. Look at verse 30 again, 1130. You guys can come up here. Somebody read that out to me, out loud. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. In 31. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not. Back to 30. What does this mean? What does this mean? It means spiritually, 
that he gives us. And we seek you that we don't see, we don't hear, we don't have God to serve him and we're moving our life because we're not giving our life to Christ. We have our idols before us and we have to look at that in our heart. Our, where, where's our, where's our priority in our heart? And that's what God judges. I mean, we do walk and we do mess up. Hence why Jesus died for us. Amen. But our heart is do we care that, we're, that we mess up? Are we repentant? When we mess up, do we go back to the God and say, God, I can't do this. I need you. I need your strength to carry me through. I need your power in me to do this. Are we doing that daily? Maybe more than once. But I mean, are we doing that? And that's, you know, what or are we saying, ah, well, you know, we all mess up. Hey, let's go, let's go watch this this show. Let's go, let's go um, you know. No, I don't, I'd rather put this before God. This is always more important before God. And do we ever walk through a day and not think of God? You know, I mean, we've walked many walks in life. Yeah. And that's okay. But are we doing it for the glory of God? Everyone is called to different vocation and career. Absolutely. But is it for the glory of God? Are we doing it to dance to our ability? Are we getting up the next day and trying to do it? I think that's the kind of work. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. It is. It's very, very good. Anybody else? That's great, Karen. I just think it's healthy. We can we can take communion until the Lord comes, and we will. But I thought today, I think it'd be really good for us to look at what Paul was leading up to as he talked to taking this communion. We can be a full gospel church. You can have full faith, full power. You can talk in another tongue. You can do all these things. Come behind and no gain. You can have Paul as your pastor and his discipleship program in and outside of the church. And we still need Jesus every day. Amen? And our cup and our, our what we eat and what we drink better be the belief in our faith that's bedrock in what Jesus Christ did for us at that cross at Calvary. Amen? Because without him, we are of all men most miserable. There be no resurrection. Amen? But with the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, we now have hope. Everybody say hope. Hope. And power with God to move into the Holy of Holies. And that's where God wants to meet with you. Amen.